This is just a sample of the audiobook. To get the complete audiobook access the link posted in the first comment. A small transport shuttle detached itself from the underbelly of a belt-registered ore carrier that had been sitting in Earth's orbit for some time. It had been waiting for the right atmospheric conditions before attempting its clandestine descent to the planet's surface. The small craft arced its way slowly downward, increasing in speed as Earth's gravity began to tug on the tiny vessel. At approximately 100 kilometers above the planet's surface, it passed through the Karman line, a point signifying the very edge of the upper atmosphere. Air molecules now began to bombard the craft's heat shield, and the pilot trimmed its angle, shifting its profile to present maximum surface area to the oncoming rush of air. It rode out the fiery maelstrom, scorching its underbelly for several more minutes before its velocity was sufficiently reduced to allow the craft to be brought under flight control. Stubby wings extended from its sides as the pilot began to drop the craft down from 18,000 meters above the central Pacific Ocean. It was heading due east, its destination, an area formerly known as Death Valley which lay on the western edge of continental North America. Over the next few minutes, the craft rapidly descended until the pilot finally engaged the twin reaction engines and adjusted the parameters for operation in thicker atmosphere. It leveled out at a few hundred meters above the surface of the ocean, now flying in stealth mode, attempting to minimize its detection by ground-based stations. Ahead, a vast electrical storm raged, and great, dense clouds blocked out the sky. The pilot oriented the craft directly toward its epicenter and increased their speed to Mach 1. Inside the shuttle, Commander Scott McNabb unfastened his harness and rose from his seat along the sidewall of the cargo hold. He moved through the central body of the craft climbed the short companionway steps to the cockpit, and stood between the two pilot seats, setting a hand on the back of each to maintain his balance. He looked out through the windshield at the fast-approaching maelstrom. The pilot glanced back and gave him a thumbs up. Scott replied with a nod and returned his gaze to the oncoming storm. Spits of rain were already peppering the windshield, atomizing on impact. Ahead, the vast landscape of black clouds obscured all view of the sky above. Here and there, you could see flashes of lightning illuminating the dense bulbous cloud formations. The rain suddenly turned into a deluge, and the view through the windshield became fractured and splintered. You better return to your seat and strap in, Commander. The pilot, Kaya Razo, lifted her hand and pointed. It's going to get pretty rough once we hit that storm proper. Scott maintained his gaze straight ahead. Do you know how long it's been since I've seen rain? I mean, real rain. The stuff that falls from the sky. The pilot glanced back up at him. Sounds like it's been a while. So long that I've almost forgotten how it feels. Scott glanced down at her. Can you imagine what that's like? No, sir. But for what it's worth? I've always hated the rain, so it don't sound too bad to me. Scott moved a little farther into the cockpit, so he could look down at the ocean below. So much water, he thought. Commander, you really do need to get strapped in. This is going to get rough. The pilot sounded more urgent now. But before Scott had a chance to reply, the shuttle bucked and rocked, as an intense blast of turbulence hit its stubby wings. Scott gripped the back of the pilot's seat tighter to maintain his balance, then nodded to the pilot, turned around, and headed back to his seat. As Razo had predicted, the ride began to get very rough, and the little craft was flung this way and that in the storm. As soon as Scott secured himself in his seat, he looked over to see how the rest of the crew was holding up. Directly across from him, Dr. Stephanie Raymond looked calm and resolute. She caught his eye, but said nothing.